the Tang Dynasty was founded by Tang Ko Zhu, whose personal name was Li Yuan. But it was really his son, Tang Taizong, whose personal name was Li Siming, who turned it into a superpower, economically, culturally, and militarily. Thus, he was traditionally known as the greatest emperor in Chinese history. And in this episode, we will look at how he did it. Li Siming came into power at a very desperate time in 626. Just as the Eastern Turkic Khaganate was attacking, his brothers plotted to kill him and seize their father's throne. So he launched a tragic counter coup that resulted in him killing them and seizing the throne for himself. Capitalizing on the ensuing chaos, the Turks were able to penetrate deep into Tang territory and within a few days of Li Siming's reign, they are already knocking at the gates of the capital, Chang'an. Uh-oh, looks like his reign is going to be a short one. But nah, Li Siming wasn't a quitter. He was a prodigious general with legendary track records, so he met them on the field. With banners streaming and armor glistening under the sun, he led his imperial army from the front. Then, without the protection of any guards, he rode up to the Turk's leader, Ilikh Khan. He looked at him with disdain for breaching their existing treaty, and then he renegotiated the peace treaty. Li Siming had to put up a strong front. If he showed any weakness, then they would bury him. He had been around the Turks long enough to know how their society work. In fact, some of his relatives were Turks due to the political marriages between the Turkic Khaganates and the previous dynasties. Their joint ruler, Tulis Khan, whose personal name was Ashina Shibobi, was even his sworn brother. Whether it was justified or not, Li Siming was confident that if push comes to shove, he could still defeat them with the right application of tactics and traps. But then, the ensuing war would devastate both sides. Not only that it will further ruin the Tang Empire, which is already hurting from the recent wars, it would also unite the various Turkic tribes in hatred against Tang. So he had to swallow his pride this time and pay them tribute for peace. Besides, he can already see the tears at the seams of their cabinet. Ilik Kahan was proud and greedy. He treated the smaller tribes within his cabinet poorly. So the opportunity to strike back was bound to present itself eventually. But for now, he has to rebuild his own empire. The succession war he fought with his brothers had split his government apart, and he had to reunite his administration. So he had to let bygones be bygones and appoint the most meritorious and talented people to the right position. He even appointed Wei Zheng, who was once his treacherous brother's advisor, to be his own. Li Siming relied on him a lot to guide him along the right path. But he needed more than just one voice. So the young emperor ordered all his officials to speak to him honestly and encourage free speech. No minister shall ever be punished for pointing out his mistakes. In fact, he actually rewarded them for doing so. Despite him wanting to recruit more soldiers to bolster his defenses against the Turks, he followed their advice to focus on working on their domestic affairs first. Thus, the warrior prince learned to be a statesman. His reign was called the Zhengguan Era, which can be translated literally as correct observation, and it became the subject of study for future emperors. It was actually quite lucky for him to have focused on domestic affairs first. There was a series of natural calamities such as droughts and unseasonal snow, so he was able to provide relief to his people and came through with minimal harm. As for the Turks, they were caught unprepared by these calamities, as the Ilikh Khan was too preoccupied trying to extract taxes from the various tribes under him. The Eastern Turkic Khaganate operated in a similar fashion to other historical nomadic empires, such as the Xiongnu. Their empire is led by the royal family, Ashina, and was made up of smaller groups within larger groups. The Tile Confederacy, for example, is a group within the Khaganate. 
But the confederacy itself is made up of a leading tribe, Chile, and smaller tribes such as the Xue Yuan Tuo, Uyghurs, and so on. Feeling dissatisfied with the Ilich Khan, the tribes started to split apart and abandoned him. Frustrated by the insubordination and his loosening grip to power, the Ilich Khan started to persecute those tribes and sent Tuli Khan to do the job. Unfortunately, Tuli was defeated by them and he himself was punished by Ilich. So he decided to rebel too and requested his sworn brother for help. Now, this is a turning point. Li Siming never expected that the Eastern Turkey Khaganate would start to unravel so soon. He wanted to help his bro, but he had to be a responsible ruler. So he consulted his ministers and generals and finally launched his campaign in 629, once he received their support. Through the years, the smaller tribes that had left the Eastern Turkic Khaganate, such as the Xue Yuan Tuo and the Kitans, had defected to Tang and sought its patronage. With Tang's help, Xue Yuan Tuo was able to form its own Khaganate and other smaller tribes such as the Uyghurs and Si came under them. So by the time the war against the Eastern Turkic Khaganate started, General Li Jing, commander-in-chief of the Tang army, received lots of military assistance from the defected tribes. And together, they defeated the Eastern Turkic Khaganate easily by 630. In the aftermath, the members of the Turkic tribes nominated Li Siming to be their new ruler. The Khan of Heaven, Tian Ke Han, which is the Chinese translation of Dingri Khan. Dengriism is the majority religion of the ancient Turks and other tribes in the area. It is often translated as Tian in Chinese. And this is the beginning of the cosmopolitan Tang Empire. Li Siming considered himself to be as much a Chinese emperor as he was the Khan of the Turkic tribes. He even boasted that he was the first Chinese emperor who treated the nomadic tribes equally as subjects instead of their inferior. As sign of goodwill, he even kept the Ilich Khan alive and gave him a governor's position. In a few generations, the streets of Chang'an would be bustling with Turkic soldiers, Persian generals, Korean officials, Indian teachers, and Japanese delegates. All of this was made possible by a combination of excellent domestic and military policies. In the following years, the Tang Empire grew more powerful and was able to effectively defend against other threats, such as the Tuyuhun and the Tibetan Empire. But the teething troubles of a cosmopolitan empire soon manifested in 639 in the form of an assassination attempt on Li Siming by some of the dissatisfied members of the Eastern Turkic Khaganate royal family, the Ashina. Luckily, the plot failed. To prevent more of this kind of incident from happening, Li Siming recreated the Eastern Turkic Khaganate and sent the Ashina and their subjects back to their land. But by then, the Xue Yuan Tuo, their former facile turned enemy, had also formed their own Khaganate and became more powerful. So Li Siming had to promise protection to both sides to fulfill his role as the Tengri Khan the Tang dynasty could have actually become a lot more culturally Turkic because Li Siming's first crown prince, Li Chengqian, was a Turkophile. He preferred to dress and speak like the Turks, and that wasn't considered an issue by his dad. His downfall, however, started when it was discovered that he had sexual relationship with a young boy. The Tang dynasty is famous for being socially liberal, but I guess that was too much even for Li Siming. Apparently, it was his obese brother, Li Tai, who snitched on him. He was after the crown prince position himself. Thus, the ensuing rivalry for the throne between a Turkophile with a lame leg and a fat scholar who was too heavy to walk must have been quite a sight to behold. And as you would expect, it ended poorly for both of them, as Li Chengqian, pressured by his brother's plot, decided to organize a coup. But his two-bit plot was eventually discovered, and he was deposed. Believing that Li Tai was also to blame for this plot, 
Li Siming disqualified him from the crown prince position too. Eventually, the position was given to his ninth son, Li Zi. But of course, there are always more than one side to every story. Their affinity towards the Turks could be interpreted differently. The Orkhon inscription was erected around 100 years after Li Siming died, after the second Turkic Khaganate declared independence from Tang. It depicted the Chinese to be a corrupting influence who drew away their people with rich gifts and ingratiating words. Only the good and stout people like them could resist their cunning. Li Siming died of dysentery in 649 and received the posthumous name Tang Taizong. He was just 51 years old and left a thriving empire to his son. He was remembered as a great emperor for generations to come for his heroism and just rule. But was he really all he cracked up to be? Now, here comes the controversy. Apparently, the importance of his role in the uprising against the Sui dynasty might have been embellished. The court journal of an official who worked under his father, Wen Daya, presented a different account to the official histories of Tang dynasty. In that book, the initiative for rebellion against the Sui dynasty was mostly attributed to his father and some of Li Siming's successors was actually credited to his eldest brother, Li Jiancheng, instead. Li Siming was also known to have interfered in the writing of court history. Generally, emperors were not allowed to look at their own history as they are being recorded. However, he insisted to look at them so that he could learn from his past mistakes. And he just sometimes need to sort a few things straight for Ahem, historical accuracy. Ahem. Well, all right, he might not be the Sage King Superman he wanted to portray himself to be. But still, it is hard to deny the fact that the dynasty prospered under him and its military dominance. The Tang dynasty hardly ever lost a major engagement. Except for that one occasion when Tang Taizong himself was humiliatingly defeated when he attacked Goguryeo Korea in 644. On the next episode, we will look at the Siege of Ansi, the lone fortress that withstood the might of Tang Taizong and the powerful army of Tang Dynasty. So subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss it. If you would like to participate in the discussion and vote on future topics, then be a pro and join us on Patreon. You can also help the channel by liking, sharing, and commenting because it boosts the algorithm. Until next time, stay cool my bros.